I've been looking forward to this particular series of lessons for some time. I've had this down on a calendar in a desk drawer for years. And uh, I told Brother Bob McAnally, I said, it doesn't seem right for me to be here in October because uh, generally I'm all over the map in the months of uh, June, July, September, October, and then November starts winding down, and the next event is the Florida School of Preaching Lectures in January. But uh, Lord willing, we'll be back with you at the lectures there. Uh, by the way, Brian is here and still working on some of those manuscripts. Brian, I get them to you when I can get them to you. But um, I want to do a study today on a series of lessons that I'll not have time to do in 40 minutes. Obviously, it took me two years uh, in the school that I direct to teach the book of Hebrews. So if you'll take your New Testament and turn to the book of Hebrews, I want to give you the high points of some of the things that are found in this book. In studying this particular book, it has encouraged my faith, and uh, I guess if it's helped me, probably it will help anybody. So this is why I'm giving this in this Bible class particular period of time. I turn to chapter 10 of Hebrews. A lot of times in a study of the Bible, we tend to start chapter 1, verse 1. But start in chapter 10, last two verses of chapter 10, verses 38 and 39. I believe that these two verses are the message of the whole book of Hebrews. Uh, I believe the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews. Some believe others wrote it. Some say, well, we don't know who wrote it, and that's particularly true because no name is given at the beginning or even at the end. But there are some details in chapter 13 that seem to make me to think that the Apostle Paul wrote this likely as the final appeal to his nation, his fleshly nation of Israel to try to get them to understand the very heart of redemption. Now, while the book of Hebrews is written to Christians, it also has a lot to say about those who wanted to hold to the law of Moses. Uh, you can't study, really, the book of Hebrews without understanding that the law of Moses is now a thing of the past. Uh, the New Testament, the New Covenant, in Hebrews chapter 8, where he quotes Jeremiah 31 to say, uh, even Jeremiah in the Old Testament prophesied that the Old Covenant was going to go away and God was going to make a new covenant. And the Hebrew writer here emphasizes the fact we're under that covenant and that it, Jesus is the mediator of the New Testament, not the Old Testament or not you know, a counterfeit testament or last will and testament, we would say. But hopefully by now you've turned to these two verses in Hebrews 10. Let me read verses 38 and 39. Verse 38 is a point of reference to an Old Testament passage. Uh, it actually goes back to the, the book of Habakkuk. It says, Now the just shall live by faith. The just, the righteous ones, will live by faith. If you've got a center reference in your Bible, you probably will find Romans 1 and verse 17, because that same reference is found in Paul's writing in the book of Romans. The just shall live by faith, but if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. My soul referring to God whose spirit. So the picture here in verse 38 is, even the Old Testament said that the righteous ones before God are those that walked by faith. Now Habakkuk 2 and verse 4 says, the just shall live by his faith. His faith. Now, uh, we understand a lot of the Old Testament quotations in the New Testament came from the Septuagint translation, but the same point of reference here, you know, they're identical. The very fact that the just shall live by faith, it goes without saying it, he goes by his own faith. For example, I can't have your faith, and I can't have your faith for you. Okay? I can only have mine. Uh, sort of like one time Brother G.K. Wallace was asked by a girl who just obeyed the gospel, said, Brother Wallace, what do churches of Christ believe? What do churches of Christ believe? Here's Brother Wallace's statement. Just about everything. Now, does Brother Wallace mean that everybody in churches of Christ believe, you know, there's green Martians on the backside of the moon? I, I don't know. But what he's saying is, if you polled or did a survey of all the members of the church worldwide and asked them any kinds of questions, you'd probably find someone, well, yeah, I believe that, whether they've got a verse in the Bible to back that up or not. But Brother Wallace prefaced his, the rest of his answer with this. Now, if you want to know what I believe, 
I'll be glad to tell you. But I'm not here to speak for all members of Churches of Christ, past, present, and even till the Lord come back. Okay? The just lives by something. We all live by something, by some code of ethics, by some uh, point of reference as far as what we actually believe or don't believe. The just, the one righteous before God, he lives by a faith that is personally his faith. However, you can't read the book of Hebrews without underscoring the fact it is possible for a believer to become an unbeliever. It's just as true for an unbeliever to become a believer, right? That's what the gospel's about. Go into all the world, preach the gospel, ever created. He that believes and is baptized shall be saved. He that believes not shall be condemned. So unbelievers can become believers, but can believers become unbelievers? And if one dies in unbelief, what does that make him? Well, if you study chapter 3 of the book of Hebrews, you'll find out what someone who follows unbelief will do. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse, uh, I believe it's verse 29, it says, By faith the children of Israel crossed the Red Sea. Now, does the Bible mean they had a point of faith when the whole nation of Israel crossed the Red Sea? I take it that's what that means. Now, but Hebrews 3 says, What happened to that generation that crossed the Red Sea in the wilderness? They did not enter into his rest. Why? Why did they not enter his rest? Because of unbelief. So here are believers who became unbelievers. Now, back to the point here in Hebrews 10, 38. The just shall live by faith, by his own faith. But if any draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. If it's impossible to apostatize, why that verse at all? And as a matter of fact, why Hebrews chapter 3 in the latter part of that chapter at all? Now, I'm not saying that you're going to lose your faith. I'm not saying before it comes to the Lord's coming back or you die, if the Lord doesn't come back in your lifetime, that you're not going to be seated here. But let me ask you a question. Do you know of people, whether it be of the South Florida Avenue congregation or Eagle Lake or, or wherever the case might be around here, because I preached at Eagle Lake, I preached at Orange Street in, in Auburndale and Clearwater, you know, uh, Central and Clearwater, you know of anybody that used to sit in these pews you're sitting in? Who no longer sit in and has, has anything to do with death. It's just they just quit the church. Okay? And then you ask the question, and I ask the question, why is, why is that the case? Why did that happen? How did that happen? At what point in your mind or in their mind did they make this move to leave the faith? To no longer, in some cases, go to the extreme, believing in no God whatsoever. Um, dealing with a case right now of a boy back home who uh, basically, uh, rumor has it, and I can't verify this, but rumor has it, he's pretty much given up on God. Well, folks, I've seen that boy grow up almost from birth in our congregation. What causes a senior, he's a senior, a senior in high school to get to the point in his brain to where not only am I not going to attend the services of the church, I'm not going to believe in God anymore. Where do you get to that point? Well, that's where the book of Hebrews comes in. There's a lot of material right here in this one book in the New Testament. All the books in the New Testament, for that matter, strengthen your faith. But this book, in particular, is a faith-building book. Okay? What is there about Christ, His kingdom, and all the technical sides of what it means to be in that kingdom? What does all of that have to do with, let me tell you something. I'm not converted to the church and I'm not converted to, to good folks as much as I respect the church and good folks. I'm converted to the Lord. And because I know who the Lord is and because I'm converted to the Lord, that pretty much settles what I'm going to be doing on Sundays. That pretty much settles also, if, unless I'm sick or you know, on my deathbed, what I'm going to be doing if there's a Wednesday night Bible study or some cases in a, you can go, they'll have them on Tuesday nights or even Thursday nights and not on Wednesdays, depending on the situation. They'll have a midweek Bible. That pretty much settles how I'm going to live my life. 
Because you see, when I confessed before I was baptized that I believe with all my heart that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that wasn't just something that came out of my mouth. That was an affirmation that there is a way now I am going to live based upon the fact I know who he is, based upon the evidence. So here's, here's some, by, by the way, people quit the church up here long time before they ever quit out there in those pews. We all do what we do starting up here long before anybody ever sees the evidence of it. Now, we've got some young folks here in this audience, and let me just sort of drive, as my daddy said, drive a peg home right here, and, and let me talk to you. You older ones, you'll get this anyway. One of these days, you're going to leave home. Matter of fact, that's what this senior is wanting to do as soon as he graduates. He can't, he can't wait till graduation. That's his statement. So that he can get as far away from where he's living as possibly can be. By the way, that's called doing the Jonah thing, trying to run. Run as far as you can run. And when you get out on your own, young folks, <clears throat> your mama and your daddy, or if you're a single parent child, your mom or your dad, they're not going to be there to wake you up. They're not going to be there to say, hey, you need, you need to go study. Or you need to go to work. Or you need to do this, you need to do that. Come on now, get up, let's get with it. Not going to be there. If you don't do it, it won't get done. It won't get done. And one of these days, you'll be looking at yourself in the mirror, or you'll be staring at the wall, and you'll have time to think. And you'll say, uh, what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do? There are a lot of people who are trying to find themselves. You ever seen somebody trying to find themselves? Uh, by the way, a lot of them are doing the Appalachian Trail. They're trying to find themselves walking 2,180 plus miles for about five to six months. What do you do? Well, I got out of college and I didn't have a job, so I decided I'd walk this trail to see if I could figure out what I want to do. By the way, nothing wrong with hiking the Appalachian Trail. I'm not against it. As a matter of fact, got sort of hankering to do that. Don't know if I ever will or not, but what is this? I, well, I, I don't know what life means to me. Well, I'll tell you what life means. It's right here in the center part of this book of Hebrews. The just lives. Well, you're all going to live whether you're righteous or unrighteous. Well, the just lives by faith. But I also understand if I don't encourage my faith, if I don't feed my faith, if I don't build on my faith, if I don't grow in faith, this old world out here will take it out of you. There's enough influences outside those doors right out there. If you followed your eyes instead of your Bible, it wouldn't be long. You'd be quitting. Now you stop and look around the world you're living in. Look at what's on television. Folks, Folks that live by faith are in the minority. Always going to be. Always. Always has been that way. And if I say, well, what's, let's take a Gallup poll and, and let's figure out what society wants as a norm. Let me tell you something. The norm out here is the abnorm when you read your Bible. Because that's not normal out there. What's normal is the just shall live by faith, meaning his faith. And he's not going to draw back. Draw back. Why? It's not going to, my soul has no pleasure in him. Now look at verse 39. We are not of them that draw back into perdition. Now the word we there is what we call an editorial we. The author being the writer, I believe Paul, talking about the fact. There's some of us that are not going to quit. That's the idea. Some of us understand. We get it. Now, for those of you that hadn't yet got up to speed, that hadn't got it yet, let me tell you something. There are some of us that will be an example to you to show you how to live your life to the day you die. Let me tell you something. You're either going to die in unbelief or you're going to die in faith. And you want an example of how to die in faith? You read Hebrews chapter 11. Look at verse 13. These all died in faith. How do you do that? Not having seen the promises, but having seen them afar off, 
persuaded to them, embraced them, confessed they were strangers and pilgrims. Let me tell you something. Whether you confess you're a stranger and pilgrim in this life is, is um, beside the point. You are a stranger and a pilgrim in this life. Now, whether you acknowledge that or not, that's up to you. A lot of people living as though the sun came up yesterday, sun came up today, sun will come up tomorrow, and I'll be here to see you. Well, that was a man in Luke 12 sort of thought that, right? And God said, thou fool, this night, this night, thy soul should be required. Of he never saw what he thought he was going to see the next day. Because he's gone from this life in the night. He didn't see a sunrise. I've done a lot of funerals of people who died suddenly. I've done a lot of funerals of people who knew they were given so many days, weeks, months to live and live longer than the doctors thought. Sometimes they didn't live as long as the doctors thought. The fact of the matter is, folks, we're all travelers. We're all strangers. We're all pilgrims in this world. This is a temporary place. And we're in a tent. You ever done tent camping? You ever done tent camping? You say, well, yeah, World War II, Korea, whatever. No, folks. Whether you ever done tent camping or not, you in a tent. You tent camping. That's what 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 says. Knowing this, if our earthly house of this tabernacle, this tent, be dissolved. We have a building. Permanent structure. Not a temporary structure. Permanent structure. Building eternal in the heavens see home is not down here 22506 Bridges Road Tony Alabama 35773 that's where I get mail that's where the mail comes home is in heaven home's in heaven and like the man on the Appalachian Trail I'm going from point A to point B I'm going home I started on January the 27th, 1957, when the Lord brought me into this world. Actually, before that, when I was conceived in this world. And I don't know what the other side of the dash on my tombstone is yet. Matter of fact, I don't want to know. Okay? If the Lord comes back in my lifetime, thrill my soul. But the point is, I'm going home. You read through the book of Hebrews all the way through. Those that walk by faith, what did they, what did they look for? About Abraham, Hebrews 11.10, what do you look for? Look for a what? City, which hath foundations, whose builder and maker and God. What does Hebrews 13 say? Here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. Seek one to come. The folks out here in the world that think they're going to be here tomorrow, and be here the next day, and the next day, and they, they don't, not only do they not know their Bible, they don't even know life. I know one man, he says, <clears throat> every morning, I encourage myself, I get up and read the obituary column. Now, what kind of guy is that? You know, you, he don't look at the, he says, I read the obituary column. He said, well, that's depressing. He says, no, as long as my name's not in it, I feel good. Makes me feel good to know my name's not in the obituary column. Because I know I'm alive. Well, you know, sir. Look yourself in the mirror, you know you're alive. You don't have to read the obituary column. You know, I live longer than that one. I live longer than that one. What kind of consolation is that? Just live by faith. I'm not drawing back. By the way, for those of us who are a lot older, we've come too far, haven't we? How many of you can, as we say, see the finish line? When I was in my mid-30s, actually early 30s, I started losing the circulation in both legs from my knees down, sitting at an office desk one day, and I knew something's got to give. So I started running, started exercising. Matter of fact, hadn't had that problem since. Got other problems, but not that problem. Because, uh, by the way, you wear out your joints running on, on hard surfaces. And uh, decided, you know, running's boring if you just do it for running's sake. So I decided I would run in races because that would give you a motivation. It would give you a goal. So I know what it is to run. I know what a starting line is. And I know what a finish line is. And let me tell you something about running races. The problem in running races is not the starting line. Man, you're not winded. I mean, you're lathered up like a racehorse ready to go when that's at the starting line. And it's not really the finish line. Once you can see the finish line, 
I can quit. You want me to tell you the tough part about running races? It's all those steps in between. That's where it's tough. How many steps have I got left to run in this race? I don't know. Let me tell you something, folks. I've been a Christian 43 years. That's a lot of running, isn't it? In this race. And I intend to finish the course, like Paul said. Fight the fight, finish the course, and keep the faith. I intend to do that. And there's a reason why I don't think preaching is silly. I don't think the Bible is a book of nonsense. You know, science and the Bible. Well, folks, the Bible's filled with science. As a matter of fact, the Bible verifies real science, not this pseudo stuff. As Paul called oppositions of science falsely so-called. In 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 21, 22, 20 and 21. Just lives by faith. We are not of them that draw back into perdition. What are we? We are of them that believe. The Greek word there is in present tense. Now, I'm not here to teach you this foreign language, but that is a very, very important point. That literally means we are of them that keep on believing. In other words, there was a point back here in where I started believing, and I will keep on believing until I cross the finish line. And by then, faith will be lost in sight then. Because I don't need faith once I cross the finish line. Faith in this life cites what you have when you cross the finish line. You go home. You go see home. You go see the God of your home. You go see the Lord that made it possible for you to go home. You go to be with the spirits of just men made perfect. Hebrews 12, 23 says. The idea that Here's a person that's racked with cancer or Alzheimer's or just, I just say arthritis. Spirit of just men made perfect. All oh, that's behind you. No pain, no sorrow, no doctor's appointment, nobody pricking your finger or jabbing you to arm to draw blood. No dental drill. Whatever the case, none of that. You think about that. By the way, just that would make heaven heaven, wouldn't it? Just that. The just lives by faith. We keep on believing to the saving of the soul. All right? Drop over to chapter 8. Just to back up a few chapters here. Chapter 8. If I were going to divide the book of Hebrews as I taught it for two years, I'd start in chapter 1, go chapter 1 and chapter 7, then go chapters 8, 9, and 10, and then go 11 to 13. Divided in unequal parts, so to speak. But in chapter 8, verse 1, you sort of got a summary statement of the whole book. Though it doesn't give you all the details of the first seven chapters, it does give you one major summary statement. Reading from the King James Version, Now of the things which we have spoken, spoken meaning written, and therefore if it was read out loud, it's, it's though it was spoken. This is the S-U-M. That's a math term, isn't it? The sum. This is the sum total of all that's been said from the time I started this writing to right now. Here it is. We have such a high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the true sanctuary, of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. By the way, that's all one sentence. Okay, verses 1, verse 2, that's all one sentence. What's the point then of the book of Hebrews? There are many things said about Jesus. By the way, just the name Jesus means Savior. He shall save his people from their sins, Matthew chapter 1. That's why the angel told him to name him Jesus. Okay? By the way, I don't know if your name means something, but names mean something. Okay? Jesus is a king, isn't he? King. He's head, head of the corner, head of the body. He's a captain of our salvation. Hebrews talks about that. But if all the things could be said about Jesus, the book of Hebrews drives one major point home about him. What is he? He's high priest. Now what does that say, first of all, not to 21st century Gentiles, as you and I are, 
What does that say to a Hebrew? What does that say to the original readers of this book? When the book of Hebrews was written, I believe in the mid-60s, 60 AD, by the way, there is a piece of ground that hadn't yet been destroyed by the Roman army. And there was a building on that piece of ground over there in the Middle East, still there. And there was an altar over there by which smoke ascended off that altar every day. And there was an individual over there that put on robes, went about his business. He was the Jewish high priest of the Old Testament. The folks began in Acts 2. The church was established. And Peter starts talking about repent and be baptized for the remission, remission of sins. Let me tell you something. That was a novel thing to a Jew. Every day of atonement, every Yom Kippur, what did a Jew who went to Jerusalem, who was commanded to fast, that was the one day a year he was commanded to afflict his soul. What did he remember every day of atonement? Well, you read Hebrews 10, you'll find out what he remembered. If those sacrifices could forgive sins, then they should have ceased to have been offered. But they weren't ceasing of offering, right? What did high priest do? Every Yom Kippur, he kept on offering those sacrifices. What did it say about the blood of bulls and goats? It don't take away sin. Not in and of itself. But what if the blood of bulls and goats pointed by faith to the ultimate Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the world? Could a man living under the law of Moses be forgiven if he died before Christ, Christ ever came? If his faith pointed in those animal sacrifices to the ultimate Lamb of God? Absolutely. That's what Hebrews 9, 15 says. For the transgressions that were under the first Testament. We always talk about the blood of the cross. It went backward all the way to Adam as much as it goes forward to the last person that needs to be redeemed by the blood of Christ before he returns. What is that? Faith is tied to your high priest who was also your sin offering. Your high priest is not down here on earth. That's his point. Our high priest is not down here on earth. We don't answer to a single, solitary individual walking on this planet. You don't answer to me. You don't answer to Brother McAnally. You don't answer to the elders of this country. You don't answer to any. You answer to God Almighty through a high priest who's at the right hand of the majesty on high. And there are a lot of folks need to be told that. They need to read that. They need to believe that. They need to know that. Too many people have tied their faith to somebody walking around on two legs down here on this earth. Folks, your faith is tied to the one to the right hand of God. In the first century, when he said that, when that was read and that was written right there, that was a novel thing to you. That physical high priest was still back there in Jerusalem. He's still burning incense by which they're praying to God. By the way, me believing that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, that's a big step, isn't it? He was a Pharisee of a Pharisee. His daddy was a Pharisee. What do you think he thought about the fleshly high priest back in Jerusalem? Folks, the fleshly high priest gave him his marching orders in Acts 9. It was the letters from the high priest Paul had in his hand, excuse me, Saul of Tarsus, same man, had in his hand when he is headed to Damascus. What do you think he thought about the high priest in the flesh back there in Jerusalem? That was his boss. Y'all got it, right? That's his boss. For him to turn around in Hebrews 8 and say, my boss is in heaven. And there ain't anybody down here is my boss. My high priest is in heaven. By the way, that's my high priest. Well, how do, you, how do you believe in somebody you can't see? Well, I can't see him right now. That's where faith comes in. But faith is not blind faith. Faith comes by hearing. And hearing by the Word of God, Romans 10, 17. 
My faith is tied to this. You won't know what I believe. I'll show you in this book what I believe. Now, you may believe something else. That's your choice. That don't make you wise to reject what's in this book. But what's in here is where your faith hangs or falls. We have a high priest at the right hand of the majesty on high who is a minister of the sanctuary. What sanctuary is that? The real one. He intercedes for us in heaven. When that prayer was led a few minutes ago, that prayer was prayed to God the Father. And by the way, it didn't go straight to God the Father. It went through somebody. No man, saint or sinner, approaches the holy God without a mediator. That's part of the attribute of God. That's a part of what all men need to understand. I'm not at all going to stand here and look up and say, Hey, Daddy-O, how's it going today? As years ago, there was a man during the hippie movement who thought that's the way you ought to pray. Let me tell you something, God, folks. When the apostles wanted to learn how to pray, here's what the master teacher said. When you pray, you say, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What's hallowed mean? Not like Halloween. What does hallowed mean? What's that word mean? It means set apart and sanctified. It means you don't use that person's name in a common or a flippant way. You're approaching God Almighty. You're approaching the majesty on high. And how do you, how do, you do that? You go through your high priest. In the day of judgment, God Almighty is the Father. As it were, sits on the court of the eternal courtroom. Those who are child children of God who walk by faith, just live by faith and died in faith. If the Lord didn't come back in a lifetime, you know who you're going to want the right hand of God? Courtroom of heaven has a judge and has two attorneys. You ever been in a courtroom? You dress like this, by the way, and they call you on jury duty, they make you the foreman of the jury. Okay? Foreman of the jury. They're sitting in a jury sitting over here in this far corner over here. Here's the judge, know all about him. By the way, if an attorney approaches the bench, do you know what they call him? They call him, your honor. Isn't that right? Your honor, can I approach the bench? Well, you go play golf with that guy. You go eat whoppers at Burger King with that guy. Yeah, maybe so. In a courtroom, you call him your honor. Isn't that right, guys? Otherwise, that's called contempt of court, isn't it? On the one side, you got a defense attorney. On the other side, you got the prosecuting attorney. Let me ask you a question. How many of you in here you know who your prosecuting attorney is in heaven? He's got a name. His name is Satan. That's your prosecuting attorney. That's my prosecuting attorney. Let me ask you a question. What does Satan know about you. Come on, just in your own memory. What does Satan know about you? Now, I'm not going to tell you what he knows about me. It's none of your business, all right? But he knows plenty. He knows plenty. And when I stand before the court of heaven, the eternal court, and my day is appointed, I got an appointment day. I don't know when it is. Lord knows when it is. When I stand before that bench, I don't have anything to say. I know what he's got to say, the prosecuting attorney. And I better have a real good defense attorney. Well, do you know who my defense attorney is? My defense attorney is my high priest. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Defense attorney. Paraclete. That's what that means. Jesus Christ the righteous. 
propitiation for our sins, not for our own, for the sins of the whole world. By the way, everybody has access to the door of that defense attorney. Now, whether anybody wants to have that man as a defense attorney, that's man's choice. But he's provided the open door policy for anybody to have that. And the just, no, I got to have that defense attorney. Because here's what I need my defense attorney to say to the judge behind that bench. I know him. He's one of mine. Because he's one of mine, he's one of yours. He's been washed in the blood that I shed on that cross. And yes, he had sins. But those sins have been covered. Well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. That's heaven, folks. That's the day of judgment. And if I don't have the blood of that defense attorney on my cause, I am left at the mercy of the prosecuting attorney. And, oh, wretched man, I am. You see why the book of Hebrews is so important? Even Hebrews 12, 23 talks about we've come to the God, the judge of all. We've not come to Mount Sinai. We've come to Mount Zion, to God, the judge of all. I told you I wasn't going to be able to cover all the book of Hebrews. Let me couple, touch on a couple of points in Hebrews chapters 2 and 5. Got about three minutes, so we'll try. I want to talk about how it is that sometimes you'll find cases of people who will draw back unto perdition. By the way, perdition means to be lost. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 1, Therefore we ought to give the more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. By the way, that's not talking about in the past, of people in the past that, that failed to do that. He is exhorting them to do this. Okay? Give the more earnest heed. Sometimes my daddy, when I was a small child, would say to me, um, Jim, I need you to do such and such. And I wouldn't immediately stop what I'm doing and do what he wanted. And he'd turn around to me after that and he'd say, Jim, did you hear me? Yes, sir, I heard you. Well, it doesn't seem like you heard me. Now, y'all might not have had a daddy like that, but that's my daddy. Okay? Now, what he meant was, I don't want just the sound of my voice going in this one or this one and out the opposite side. That's not what I'm looking for. What I'm looking for is for you to hear, understand, and apply what I said. And I didn't mean tomorrow. I didn't mean an hour from now. I meant right now. My daddy's daddy <clears throat> used to send him on errands. They called him Pop. I don't know why. Or Doc. Doc Clark. By the way, he wasn't a medical doctor unless he doctored dogs and cows or whatever. But my granddaddy Clark's statement to my dad when he'd give him money to send him to town to go get something at the store and come back, as soon as dad would walk away, here's granddaddy Clark's statement. Is that you I see coming back? That's a quote. I mean, he hadn't gone five steps away from his own daddy. Is that you I see coming back? What, what did Doc Clark mean to my daddy by that? What do you mean? That means you go do exactly what I told you as quick as you possibly could and don't dally and get right back here with what I need. That's what he meant. That's the background by which I was raised. And my daddy had a way of cleaning my ears out. And it wasn't with a Q-tip. It was at a different part of my anatomy. And it didn't take many times working on that part of my anatomy for me to figure out what he meant. He'd get my attention. 
God Almighty is not up here with the switch or the belt or the belt strap or whatever you want to call it. Waylay and says, you know, come on, boy, get with it. Is that you I see coming back? Hebrews 11, 6 says, God is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him, but he is only a rewarder to those that diligently seek him. What does diligently seek mean? It means to give the more earnest he. There's a difference in the Bible between take heed and give the more earnest heed. Both of them are parallel, but one intensifies it. When you get to Hebrews 5 and verse 12, when for the time you ought to be teachers, you have need one teach you again the first principles of the arches of God and have need of milk, not strong meat. How in the world do they who've been members of the church likely for 30 years, how do they need to be taught all over again when they ought to be teachers? Somebody didn't give the more earnest heed. How many of you remember every word your high school teacher said and you could quote it verbatim? I took art appreciation at Freed Hardman. By the way, I'm a Bible major, not an art major. There's very little of that I can tell you anything about. I need it for humanities credit. I didn't give, not even the most earnest heed, I didn't even give heed to it. I studied it to pass a test to get out. That's what I did. Y'all ever been there? Come on, shake or nod. Then what good was it for you to take that class? Because somebody said, to get a degree, you got to take that class. Or something like it. Folks, this isn't that kind of book. This is your soul. This is your eternal destiny. And you understand that. You'll pay attention in church. One last thought. <clears throat> if our brethren from sea to shining sea and around the world came into church buildings or Bible classrooms with the intention of this attitude, I'm not coming to a Sunday school class just to sit in the pew to fill up a time slot. I'm going to come to class today with the full intent to learn what I'm taught and to apply it when I walk out that door. Now you tell me, you tell me what our brotherhood would be like. Just that attitude. My wife's a first grade school teacher. Let me tell you something. Their kids in first grade don't give a flip about school. All they care about is this two-pointed ball that they think they're going to make millions of when they become adults. That's all they care about. Now you talk about football, they'll hang on every word you say. You talk about reading, writing, and arithmetic, they don't give a snap of your finger what that means. Let me tell you what's more important. It's reading, writing, and arithmetic and learning this right here and applying it. as your faith. It's as good as your knowledge of the Bible. It's as good as your application. Take a break. Let you get up and as we say, walk around. <laughs>